Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you again for your patience. I'm Cynthia Tindongan, and I am from Ohio University. I'm on the board of the USETDA Association, and um, I'm glad that you're here, both in the room and uh, joining us virtually. I'm delighted to introduce you to John Foudreau, who will be um, talking about whose cue is it anyway, integrating accessibility in your templates, educating support staff, and showing when the rules can bend. We would like you to ask you to um, mute and turn off your audio unless you are actively participating. And with that, we'll turn it over to John. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so yeah, my obviously my title is a probably a reference that may be timely now, not or not timely, I should say, uh, but to whose line is it anyway? Uh, and it does seem like improv is the, the name of the day today. So um, make sure we get all this working. So I am the repository librarian for the University of Pittsburgh. Um, my role there is uh, obviously to take care of the institutional repository. I've been there since 2014. Um, I manage the, that in several subject archives uh, using the same platform currently. Uh, but I also have taken on the role of coordinating ATD support and training. So um, we utilize our institutional repository for the ETD process. And so it made it a perfect fit to have uh, me be able to take over some of that, those duties. So uh, today we're going to go through some some um, interesting puns on segments that used to be in that show. If you had watched it previously, uh, I want to talk about our, our background in history, the process that we use. Which, after listening to the plenary session, uh, should be an interesting, informative uh, snapshot of how our process has changed over the last. Uh, I guess it's been about 21 years or eh, somewhere around that. Yeah, or well, 20 years about. And um, what we've done to revise our support setup and integrate accessibility and training into uh, our informative uh, materials that we give out and workshops that we provide. Uh, and then I'll talk a bit about what I've tried to do to help with our support staff uh, and do the training there and provide the resources for them uh, as they continue on their ETD approval process. Uh, and at the end, we'll have time for questions. Obviously, we, we can take some time. I usually talk pretty quickly, so we might have a lot of time, uh, depending on how this goes. Um, so as I mentioned, I, I guess our ETD program in the current state um, started around 2005. There was a, a um, panel put together in the university to transition our print manuscript process into the electronic thesis dissertation process in 2004, and it was uh, formalized in 2005. And they used a uh, ETDDB database platform for submission and archival um, uh, maintenance then, but it transitioned into our ePrints repository we currently use for our institutional repository, which allowed for uh, author self-submission of works, which then facilitated students being able to submit their ETDs uh, for approval. Now, at the same time, the university decided that it would be best to have a decentralized approval process, which has its positives and negatives, obviously, uh, but utilizing the institutional repository and the functions in ePrints uh, allowed for that mediated approval process. So we could literally say only people in the School of Engineering get to see these ETDs for the School of Engineering. So it helped facilitate that efficiently uh, for the most part, but it involved a lot of training, a lot of maintenance uh, for us to continue performing those sorts of reviews. So this was the, the general setup that we have for what we call our ETD process group, uh, which is a pretty much a volunteer group from different organizations in our university, obviously led by the Office of the Provost and with support from the Registrar's Office, and then several um, individuals who may who want to serve on this, uh, this body for making policy decisions from different graduate schools. Uh, we term them as student services staff, uh, and it's just somebody who is doing the approval or, or providing the graduate information to the students. And the university library system has always had somebody involved uh, in this process, uh, but it was to different degrees throughout the years. Now, currently, we're quite involved in the process, and my role has escalated from more or less just a support role where we'd ans answer questions about formatting uh, to trying to lead a lot of the, the innovations that we're doing in the process and uh, steer things toward uh, a more accessible version of our ETD process. Now, I put this in as a bit of a, a lighthearted comment, but sometimes this feels very true, uh, that this statement being a camel is a horse designed by a committee. And uh, if any of us have ever served on committees making longstanding policy decisions, you may understand that sometimes what you intended to have when you started that conversation, started the process, 
turns out to be something completely different. And many of those looking on from what you ended up with wonder how you got there. Uh, and I'm not trying to be critical of our process or where we're at right now. Um, but this is definitely something when I came in in 2017 um, to be more engaged in the ETD process group, um, I started to wonder why we were doing certain things that we had always been doing. Um, so as an overview, I heard a lot of interesting variations upon the theme, if you will, for how ETDs are approved in different universities. Generally speaking, this is how we have the process set up and what we have to manage. We have our guidelines that were set from this original group based mainly upon the manuscript formatting guidelines that were for print. And it is something that I continue to try to bring up in our conversations is that we need to think beyond print at some point. Uh, we don't need it to necessarily look exactly like a uh, typed manuscript looked in 1982. Uh, we can do better with uh, the technologies we have in front of us uh, and make it more seamless for students to create something that looks professional is, and is accessible in their final version of their ETD. So the guidelines loosely addressed accessibility when it wasn't necessarily a thing that we were considering in 2004, 2003, when it was originally drafted. Um, and they tend to focus more on format than function. And when I say that, I mean, it was going back to, uh, as I heard earlier, getting out the ruler. And I had heard tales of ETD reviewers literally holding a ruler up to their screen to measure the margins on a PDF, even though there's a ruler function. I know it sounds interesting, but they did that. Um, so trying to figure out how we can make the format more consistent and easier to get to and less restrictive as well uh, for a lot of things, uh, but ma making sure that the functionality of the document is, is working and the accessibility is, is the real key feature uh, for the future documents that we create. So the templates that we have, um, based upon those guidelines, was, was they created a Word template um, that was basically, uh, the idea was to make it so that you could easily make a PDF from that, whether using the plugin from Adobe or just the save as PDF. Um, from both PC and Mac. Now we don't have a cloud version for the 365 uh, Word uh, application yet. It's That's a little more difficult, uh, but they're still able to do a lot of the editing, but this was the original coming from 2004. Um, when I came in in 2017, it was just a document. So it was a docx. Um, and I said, why is this not a template document? Uh, which then improved things greatly because what we, you know if you've worked with Word documents, uh, not having the base template downloaded onto your device can cause problems when it tries to reference different styles as they change. Um, now the LaTeX template was something, again, I had to learn quite quickly. Uh, it was a heavily customized, um, it wasn't even based on the thesis type, uh, so it was a very heavily customized version of another template um, that when originally made, uh, we, we commissioned a student uh, in the music program, actually, at Pitt to develop this LaTeX template. And he wrote a lot of interesting comments within the, the template itself and the, the associated documentation. Um, but in doing so, in, the, in applying certain um, techniques to create it, over time, they started to deprecate uh, certain things and also go into conflict with other packages that were being used, especially in the sciences and even in mathematics um, with how we were setting up it, the, the hyperref to create headings and so on uh, and the PDF version that was created from it. So trying to understand where they were originally trying to, to start off with the template and where it is now is back to the Campbell reference. Uh, and that's what I have to try to deal with with the templates. Um, now, the approval process, as I mentioned, is a student submitted via the scholarship or institutional repository. Individual staff or teams uh, within the, the graduate schools will do the review and the repository and then send it back to the student in that particular uh, deposit structure with sometimes commentary within the repository, sometimes sent as an email. Uh, I've recently been trying to do annotated PDFs and teach staff how to do that. Uh, so again, that's another training area where we had to do a little bit of technology training for those who weren't uh, as adept with Adobe Acrobat uh, to do the annotation. So it made it easier for the students to see, I'm talking about this paragraph on this page versus sending an email saying on page four, you need to change this paragraph. Well, is it four on the page or four in the PDF? Um, aggravation abound with that. Um, 
After this, which the student would then revise and re redeposit through that uh, particular uh, record within our institutional repository and the staff would approve it upon graduation and apply any embargoes or, or what have you that needed to be associated with that. This, however, was uh, apart from the rest of the administrative process. So the schools individually controlled uh, making sure on the graduation forms, surveys, any payments for the process fee uh, or any other records that needed to be aligned before they could graduate. That was all separate from the institutional repository and separate from the particular process. Uh, so that also caused a bit of, of fissures to develop and how we were checking things, how they were being approved and timing. Um, now the institutional repository is ePrints for now. We are looking in, at changing to a different platform, uh, but it does allow for embargoes and restricted metadata. So we could change it so it, uh, something is only available to pit for a certain amount of time. And we also have a dark archive state, which is basically saying that the metadata is hidden as well as the full text uh, from everybody, even the person who originally uh, added the record. So. It is file agnostic, and we are looking to improve that in the future iteration of our repository to make sure that we can do uh, things that are beyond text. We want to make sure if we have videos or supporting material, things like that, uh, it can be included in the, the review process, which adds another layer of complication to how we continue to train and provide guidelines for what is acceptable when you get beyond words on a page. Now, in terms of technology, we try to make it as simple as possible for the most part, but as we know, those of us who work with documents and files uh, daily, that it's always amazing how many different glitches can happen depending on what version you're using, what OS you're using, um, where you got your template from, and so on. Um, so we try to make it so students would only need the MS Word application or LaTeX compiler or Overleaf, which we use uh, abundantly now uh, with, with on our campus. Um, but sometimes that could be problematic. And I've seen people who will take a Word document, make a PDF, then convert it back from a PDF to a Word document uh, and try to keep them educated on what the base process is for file creation uh, is sometimes tricky. Um, as I mentioned, cloud-based apps are not really supported in our process yet. I've been trying to explore a, a different way to allow students to create documents uh, for those that use things like Google Docs or what have you. And it's not necessarily as simple as it seems with that regard. So we're, we're still keeping that far away from uh, saying that it's active, but we, we try to help where, where it's possible. Now, currently, we don't have a need for the student to download or use Adobe Acrobat uh, in the creation process. Previously, we had them uh, create the Word file and use the plugin to create it and then go in and check for bookmarks and things and add bookmarks that were not uh, compiled uh, from the original Word document. But some innovations I took with the, the Word template made it possible so that we didn't have to have them create anything, uh, which did cut down a lot of aggravation and a lot of review lag uh, when they were uh, submitting. So again, I love my quotes. I love uh, that nothing there is but change. Um, and that is absolutely true in the process. And I think most of us will, will agree with that, uh, that oftentimes there are, are opportunities to continue to develop or change the process uh, that we've been using for years and years and years. So what I did when I came in uh, and my Office of Scholarly Communication Publishing that I work within in the library, we looked at what the common issues were. Now we have a ticketing system called, uh, from SpringShare that Lib answers. We call it our ETD support helpline basically um, that we were seeing most common things were how do we preserve the bookmarks in the final PDF? which is a, a guideline mandate that we have that we wanna make sure that all bookmarks are there for reading accessibility. That anybody with low to no vision would be able to read this with a screen reader. And sometimes if the students were not following the directions that we did provide at the time, uh, this was a very common complaint and a common review comment, if you will, um, uh, from the schools when they were turning their ETDs. Um, links were broken to chapters and captions and so on, which is again, another process problem in how you are creating your document or whether you're using the particular styles that we've included in the Word document uh, and trying to educate the students on what that means and how they can fix that. Um, page numbers might shift from the preliminary sections, which we have ro lowercase Roman numerals, which shift to Arabic numbers in the body of the text. And that's something again, that was somewhat hidden from the students uh, in terms of the formatting. Uh, how that was done. And so try to make sure we provide documentation uh, on that was something I, I tried to make sure we could have available. There was often unclear instructions on how to do something as simple as making a page landscape from portrait style. And also even simpler than that, I suppose, was where you can go for help. Um, when I took over the position, one of the issues that we had was there were two different 
um, ETD, library generated ETD distribution list for answering questions. One was called ETD support. Uh, and I actually can't remember what the other one was called offhand, but they both had ETD in the title. And so even the staff that had been doing it for years didn't know which one to use to have their question answered. Um, so we simplified that, we streamlined the process, uh, and we, we made sure what we could do with the refinement of our support process, but also the ETD process in general. So the, the group that we had mentioned previously changed membership slightly. We added a few more people, and we made it something that had a standing meeting uh, maybe quarterly at best when it first started, but we set out to look at a multi-phase analysis of the process, look at, for areas where we can make changes and improvements, uh, and basically a process audit at that point. Uh, but, al but also to set it up to say, we are going to be working over time to make sure that we get to a new place where we can say we we are doing something for the students that makes sense. It, it, it reduces some of the the issues that we have been seeing come up, especially for staffing as well. Um, create an updated site that that had been lagging for years. Uh, for instance, an example I, I always go back to when we talk about what we did was that there was a section for video tutorials that had three PDF documents in it making sure things like that were updated and were actually useful to the students uh, and the staff members who might need it for reference. And after the pandemic, especially as we started the, the phase, the multi-phase analysis slightly before the pandemic started, but it definitely took hold when, um, when we had lockdown at the university that we wanted to make sure any analog forms could be reduced to zero if possible. We didn't want the students going around campus trying to find professors to sign their committee forms. Uh, and things like that. So anywhere we could streamline the process to make it digital, uh, to make it easier to do and uh, more concise, that was one of our, our big uh, ideas. So the process became what we put into three different channels, prepare, write, and submit. And obviously we prepare was teaching and training and providing the resources. Uh, when it came time to write, this was giving them information, the things they need to think about once they have the concept for what they are writing, uh, and where to go for help. So we have copyright primers, we have formatting guidelines and, and instructions and tutorials beyond just the general guidelines. Uh, but we also have our, our ATD support desk, which currently is just myself and uh, my supervisor helps when I'm out of the office. Uh, we have a student support assistant that uh, we also utilize for our chat services, which may be a walk-in desk uh, once things are settled in our, our current situation with our building renovations. Um, and the final stage was talking about how do you submit and what do you do once you submit? How do we uh, communicate who's going to be doing this process, who to contact and for those particular questions, and what to do after it is approved, what other options you have for embargoes, uh, and uh, reaching out to ProQuest for services. Uh, because that's also something I didn't quite mention is that our, our process is that we uh, currently, at least with ProQuest, is that we, once approved, ProQuest harvest from our institutional repository once a month, uh, and if anything is available open, uh, via open access uh, for the state of that particular ETD, it will then be submitted to ProQuest for inclusion, uh, and they will make the microfiche and have it uh, hosted on their database. So um, making sure students understand that process and that complicates things sometimes with copyright. Um, so anytime we have any sort of unclear advice, anytime there's a complex issue that comes up, we try to route it through us, uh, through ETD support at the library, because we have made enough connections and have an understanding of the process, and we are keeping up to date with that. Whereas sometimes when you get to uh, a staff member who has maybe literally four students graduating uh, every other year, uh, they're not engaged in the process and understanding what needs to be done. So one of the other things I tried to do beyond what was already instilled within the, the ETD templates, was to add accessibility shortcuts. And what we mean, what I'm talking about with that is that currently speaking, if we took our ETD template, the Word template as we have it, create it into a PDF and run it through an accessibility check, it will get probably 90%, 85 to 90%, depending on what has been done in the document. Um, and that's a great thing to start from, but we're not at 100. And I'd like to make sure we get to closer to 100 if possible, as we go down uh, the line for accessibility standards at the university. Then we customize the styles in the Word document so when they're made into PDF bookmarks, uh, they will meet the standards for headings and bookmarks within a PDF. We try to take advantage of the template to add instructions. So not, not the current version that's out right now, the next iteration of it that I'm going to release uh, quite soon, uh, will have many, many more instructions taken from some of our tutorials, 
added as chapters within the template so the student could read through them before they delete them and add their own content. They will have them there as a reference and they will always have the template on their, on their document, uh, on their um, device as well uh, to refer to. Now, keeping images in line is another thing we, we've been trying to educate and, and talk about that if you use text wrapping in your Word uh, for images in a Word document, it can sometimes vary where the placement of the images on the page and, and they ever cause some issues with uh, how the, the caption is inserted and sometimes making a break with that in a list of figures, list of tables. Um, so trying to educate on image formatting and image placement in a document has been troublesome and tricky, but we're getting there and we're, we're doing more with that and, and educating more students on how to do that. Now again, font families, providing the suggested font families, we use Times New Roman. I'm not a big fan of that, to be fair. I think a sans serif font is better. Um, I have a background slightly in graphic design, so I would rather see a sans serif font, but we are still using what has always been done currently, and that's what we, we want, might want to move from uh, for accessibility, because that is one of the suggestions as well. Now with the LaTeX template, as I heard others who struggled with LaTeX, and again, as somebody who had not used it previously, um, trying to understand how to educate students, how to provide support for structures that were sometimes um, in conflict from what needed to be done, which is what was commonly done in LaTeX, um, is problematic. But trying to provide instructions on placement of figures and things like that uh, to go around what, again, they might be commonly doing when creating their documents uh, from a raw template uh, has been helpful. Um, trying to suggest how we add caption labels and the descriptive text to those uh, captions has also been quite successful in allowing students a little more flexibility in how they add their captions. Um, down the line, we're going to be trying to, to assess what's the best way to create your PDFs. Um, I have been reading about the, using the PDFX package to create um, tag sections and so on, uh, because currently the, the, the way we are doing it is not necessarily always successful and it definitely does not meet accessibility standards. So try to find the best way to create a LaTeX document that is accessible without having to spend a lot of time remediating in Adobe Acrobat uh, is one of my goals, but it, that will be hard. And again, the sans serif font mandate uh, in, in LaTeX especially as well can be something we can do to allow for different spacing options uh, as LaTeX uh, generates its, its uh, uh, segments into the document. So. In FY22, I decided to do a slightly off the cuff ETD approval analysis. So I took every ETD that was approved in the repository and I analyzed them on these very basic standards to say, number one, were the bookmarks there? That was one of the things we've had since the, in the beginning of the, the process and the guidelines we set out. Um, so I, I said, I'm gonna go click through and check and make sure they're here or they're not. I'm gonna check images and tables for alt text I'm going to look and see what the font families are and if they seem okay. And also check to see if there's any file info, which is, again, another accessibility standard uh, that we have not talked about at all with students or the supporting staff that do the approvals. So this is not a general. There were some differences in numbers. If you look now how many are in uh, for this particular year, uh, there were some issues, administrative issues with getting things approved in time. Uh, but Generally speaking, this is going to be our benchmark for the next year or two as we start doing some of these changes to say how much have we improved and how closer, much closer are we to getting accessible documents using some of these general standards uh, to do that. So what are some techniques and tips that we used to get to there and what I suggest you do as you continue to develop your processes? I know this can also be difficult if you're the only person doing this for a lot of students, uh, but maybe some of these things might help streamline some of this for you and make it a little easier. So taking a look at the process, taking a look at what is required and what you actually uh, need to be doing uh, in terms of uh, the staffing and the comfort levels for the staff. If they are completely swamped in terms of approvals, maybe there's a way to, to uh, spread that approval out if possible or to make some segments of the approval process uh, easier uh, for them. So do a staff survey. I, we did a, I did a staff survey uh, for the familiarity of the guidelines when I got there because I didn't know the guidelines when I first started uh, the position and I wanted to see that the people who were approving and, and citing the guidelines to the students, if they actually knew what the guidelines were. Um, and that was an interesting um, uh, segment of the situation that was going on and, and a snapshot of what was happening. Um, and it allowed me to generate more instructions and train based upon what they were not really understanding. And then to ask the questions as well, 
do we need this? Why are we doing these? Why is this standard this? Why is it this many DPI when that's different now, 10 years from when it was written? Um, and things like that. So then I made an open request form uh, for updates or changes to be made to the process or to the template or the website. Uh, and I made that available to the staff so that they could say, I'm having an issue with this. Can you help me fix this or add this to the site or what would have you? Or if they thought a guide would be useful, that was a, a way for them to, to add to the process and give feedback at the same time. I also started hosting open meetings um, to educate and take questions. So I would give them a little snapshot of something that was happening or talk about why a standard is, is this particular way and what why this is what you need to tell students for X, Y, or Z, but also just a time for them to say, I don't understand what about this about the process. Can you help us understand a little better? So doing that made them feel more involved in the process and also allowed them to answer the questions uh, more succinctly to the students when something came up, rather than go, you know, you need to fix this and, and send a message back to them and then send them to me. Um, so it kept us all involved and all supporting each other and the approval process. I also made a staff oriented uh, list of do's and don'ts. Um, so it was a very general thing to say, um, don't approve something that doesn't have bookmarks. Don't approve something that says, do, do this. It makes it easier. Uh, and they're hosted behind the scenes on our intro web uh, for our ETD site uh, and shared in the training for new staff members uh, because we do have uh, quite a lot of changeover in staff over time. Uh, and, and having new staff come into a process, usually at the last minute, we find, um, and try to have them understand what they need to do and be able to approve graduate uh, students' requests um, in a short amount of time and in a very daunting process uh, can be troublesome and tricky, but we did it. Uh, and so also having a checklist of approval steps um, customized to a SharePoint form, we are um, experimenting with that to go beyond just the ETD approval and the document approval to go into where are you at in the stages of your submission for all your other documents as well. So one of our, our graduate programs has been uh, piloting this where they've created it in SharePoint so they can send a view to the student of their particular set of records for saying, yes, I, you have your approval form in, you've paid your process fee, uh, you've submitted your survey and doctorate and things like that. Uh, and they can see what they're missing uh, visually, which makes it a lot easier for everybody to know what else they need to be doing. So, what have we tried and what I suggest you might try? Do some sort of monthly open meeting, whether it's a Zoom or in person, host a workshop or brown bag, uh, go out to the schools and talk to them directly. Um, try to get in on any sort of um, introductory meetings at the beginning of semesters. To talk about Word, accessibility, copyright, whatever it might be, um, continue to engage with the things surrounding the ETD approval process. Uh, we found that to be really uh, successful to get them interested. I don't know that it always uh, changes their worldview in terms of document formatting, uh, but it definitely allows them to understand a little bit of sometimes what seems to be uh, a really obtuse process uh, and sometimes daunting um, uh, technology ga uh, gaps that happen in terms of, of well, we're going to this to this. How does that work? I have no idea. Um, and we can try to help them and make it easy to understand and get to where we need to be. Um, create a site, if you can, even if it's a shared folder in a OneDrive folder or something like that uh, for forms and policy documents and process maintenance documents uh, that helps you understand, again, where you started from and where you need to go. Uh, and it will help you have something to reference because we have had this also, not necessarily for the ETE process, but in the library in general, we had, and an, it's uh, ironic as well, I suppose, uh, that we had uh, things in a box folder that were deleted as policy documents because somebody left the university uh, and they didn't retain um, the access to that box folder and they were just automatically deleted when they left. And so making sure you have a site to refer to forms and documents is a great thing to do. Um, so make use of, of any sort of support services or uh, for your workflow questions and any policy questions, if possible. I know that everybody's in the same situation that we are in or have necessarily the staffing capabilities uh, for something like this, but finding out where you can go to have a knowledge base or somebody who can refer these sorts of questions, whether it's from the student or from a faculty member, a committee faculty member uh, about what's going on, about the process and formatting, copyright, whatever, um, really helps to, to keep everybody engaged and have a resource to know where they need to go. 
So what am I thinking about for the future? What, what I, I'm not sure if anybody else is doing certain things in this regard, but this is at least where I'm thinking we need to go and what I'll be trying to do in the next year or so is to start making um, tagged boilerplate language that the, the staff can use when reviewing. Um, because again, this, this is from one school to the next, it's quite different in how they provide feedback and how they talk to the students about what they expect. They may say, your, your paragraph margins are off, this must be fixed. Cool, but could you say, your paragraph margins need to be one inch on each side, and here's how you would do that. Here's a resource, here's our guide to do that. So try to create an easy way to insert the, the language for how to interact with the students, makes it easier for them, uh, and it cuts down a lot of the back and forth, because our, in the library, we are not involved in the approval process. So I often don't see the feedback that the school is giving. So trying to understand what they've told the student and the student tells me something slightly different. Uh, and it's that game of telephone uh, that it, it sometimes can be really aggravating on our side because we're trying to help, but we don't know what's being asked. Um, at the same time, I'm trying to engage more with the staff. I wanna make more connections with the faculty to do in-class workshops, be embedded in the process. Uh, and to allow, the, to take some of the weight off the staff's shoulders. They don't need to do workshops uh, for the students if they don't want to. Uh, the library, at least in, in my, my view, we can do that. And I wanna try and engage more and provide that earlier on in the graduate process, graduate school process, so that the students are, are equipped with what they need to know to make the document much faster and, and simpler than uh, if they brought something they've been working on for several years and like, oh, I have a month to format it in this particular way and I have no idea where the template is, what to do and so on. Um, also to create an onboarding workflow, uh, an informational site or packet or what have you to give to new staff members earlier in the process. Currently, we, we basically would suggest staff be trained by one of our um, longest standing staff members who originally wrote the process when it was, was started and the guidelines, um, but they are finding themselves uh, stressed for time. So trying to make sure everybody can get training in a timely manner would be uh, more efficient if we had some sort of onboarding packet to give them or training, uh, what have you, that is codified and easily shared. And again, more open training sessions. I want to focus more on Office software, such as Word and Adobe, um, and really get into the nuts and bolts of what you can do with that. Uh, that could also be utilized in their other responsibilities beyond ETDs. So trying to go quickly here, if only have a few minutes, I see. Um, a Picasso quote of learn the rules like a pro, so you can break them like an artist. Um, the mantras that I'm moving forward with as well, and looking at the manuscript guidelines that were originally there, was to start looking at function over form. And I know this could be in contention with others uh, and the, 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 the uh, theories about what, what is meant to be for, for documents, but I, I'm looking at what's meant to be for accessibility, looking at shorter paragraphs, bigger breaks, so we have accessibility addressed. Uh, I don't care about the justification, if it's left, right justified, or uh, if it is left justified, uh, but be consistent within the document, make it look professional. Um, think about page breaks. Don't just use a bunch of paragraph returns to make a page break. Um, because it's functionally speaking better in Word to do it with the actual uh, application uh, functions there than uh, doing it with paragraph returns. Bibli bibliography style should be more fluid. Uh, we had a suggested format, and I would rather have students work with what they'll be publishing in uh, so that they can have more, uh, be more accustomed to what they'll be doing professionally uh, rather than the arbitrary style that we use for ETDs. Uh, and also focusing more on supplemental files and how those are associated with the document. Uh, say if somebody has an audio recording of an of, uh, interview they did with someone, how do they link that up to their document and put it into the repository uh, to be better uh, referenced later? Look at individual expression. I want to make sure that students have more uh, ability to customize the layout, but still make it professional. And how can we facilitate that without completely breaking uh, a lot of the, the functional guidelines and functional things we want to see for accessibility? I heard this earlier about the three paper theses or dissertation. Uh, we currently don't have particular guidelines for that, but I want to have that uh, codified in the way that we can tell students this is what's expected, here's how you do it, uh, so they're not shooting in the dark uh, about what, how to make that happen. Um, looking at variant versions, and this is something that's come up recently for us that we have a lot of uh, copyright holders who are suggesting that we can't include certain things in, in uh, the versions of the ETD that will be submitted to ProQuest. 
Um, so how can we make open access versions that would be housed in the repository, but then also copyright restricted ones that could be shared uh, in ProQuest? So that's something we're, we're dealing with and trying to figure out how we can break the rules or make new paths. <laughs> so what to do with non-textual submissions? What do we have a student uh, that's created the website and, and they want to submit that as a major part of their document? Um, and also Excuse me, John. Yo, yes. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, you have about five minutes left. Gotcha. And uh, I don't know if you'd like to take some time for questions or you'd like to just keep going through your material. As a presenter, that's up to you. Okay. Um, I think I would quickly. I'm not sure. I got a little bit left, but I guess I can open up to questions. Um, but yeah, my, my finale here is just to listen, plan, innovate, instruct, reflect, and keep listening. So I think that's true in a lot of things, but um, definitely true in the easy process, I find. So sure, if there's any uh, questions, i um, be happy to take them. Uh, anybody in this room could come up to the mic. It would be better if David just came right up here. Oh, sure. Yeah. Come up here, please. Or um, what about from uh, virtual folks? Okay, um, Kristen Terrell asks, can you explain what... I think you got muted there. Sorry, I don't hear you. Uh, um, one of our participants is asking if you can explain what what bookmarks are. Sure. Um, in terms of what we consider a requirement for bookmarks, uh, when you open up an Adobe uh, document, Adobe PDF and Acrobat, uh, there will be a bookmarks tab. So these are... Uh, hyperlinked section markers within a document. Um, and I know bookmarks in Word are a slightly different thing, uh, but in terms of a PDF, a bookmark is the sectional uh, link that is used for navigation, but also for screen readers to be able to to understand what section you're looking at. Um, but I don't, I don't have one pulled up right now to show you offhand, but it is something you can create in Word using headings uh, and some particular settings to do that, to generate your PDF from a Word document that has bookmarks already there, which again, streamlined the process for students um, to create a more accessible document. John, you talked about the uh, three paper uh, thesis or dissertation. Uh, do you place those papers? Um, how do we place them? Um, well, they, they, they're, they're still considered um, alongside every other uh, ETD that we approve. Um, the unfortunate thing is how do we format, uh, as I heard, uh, the metadata for it to say what, it, what is the bibliographic information for that document? Uh, and how do we adjust things like abstract and chapters and, and so on and so forth. Um, we still don't have great guidelines for that, but it's basically just assumed to be uh, chapters within the, the ETD document. Uh, and to varying degrees, each school feels comfortable providing feedback on that. Um, because we, we are you know, proving ETDs for um, every sort of school, um, from you know the school of law to to uh, chemistry to uh, um, computer science, uh, it, it becomes difficult sometimes to to keep the standards in line for what is common within the field um, in terms of how they write their their uh, uh, research documents and maybe doing their projects. So we've been trying to figure out how we can keep things that are maybe copyright protected as well uh, for chapters and and teach more about getting preprints and policies for for publishing. Uh, but everything is still fit into the document in the template, the same as any other. So it's sometimes difficult. <laughs> is the authorship on the paper a single author? Um, well, they, they will reference the authorship of the papers within the chapter, um, but we, we can only have one author for the ETD itself. So they would have to write some sort of summary uh, or um, something that, that joins the three papers, if you will. Uh, as an introductory chapter. Uh, so this, this this is my work and I've participated in these particular papers. Um, but it, it, so the ETD itself is considered authorship for the single uh, student and not a uh, reference to all the other authors. Yeah. Tomorrow in the session, tomorrow morning, uh, placement of, you know, previously published information in a manuscript. It's kind of our, opinion right now that uh, the 
manuscript should be reserved for the voice of Satan for several reasons. And we'll talk about that tomorrow. Excellent. Okay. It also eliminates a lot of formatting if you put it back in a different way. Absolutely. I look forward to that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you. And we are we are out of time today. So I want to thank John Foudreau from the University of uh, Libraries and all of the participants in the workshop um, in the session. Thank you so much and looking forward to the next Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.